Good day. My name is Rudd Turnbull, and it's a pleasure to talk with you today. It's been said, and I think it's true, that the only journey worth telling about is the psychological journey. But I think it's also important sometimes to tell the physical journey, and to do both of those together is a way of illuminating the history of the field and the future of the field. It is somewhere in the middle 1970s, I have been asked by the governor of North Carolina to go to a large state institution to investigate something called aversive intervention. I went out there and seated at a very, very large table in a very fancy uh, conference room with psychiatrists, psychologists, physicians, qualified mental retardation professionals, so on and so forth. People began to talk about baseline. Well, I'm a lawyer. I'm a boy from New York City. I didn't know what baseline was except home plate to first base, Ebbets Field, Brooklyn Dodgers. Then they started to talk about their learning to be better box. And now my curiosity became a little bit more acute. I said, what is it? They said, well, it's a little box about four inches wide. It helps us teach people to be better. I said, well, that's interesting. What is it? And they told me the same thing. I said, listen, you're not telling me what I need to know. Go get it. I want to see it. They said, oh no, it's in a different room. It's in a different building. I said, listen, the governor sent me here, told me to do something, and I'm going to write him back and tell him that you're keeping me from doing what he wants me to do. Now, do you want me to do that or not? They said, no, no, we'll go get it. They brought in a little box about four inches high, four inches wide, four inches deep, two little battery nodules, copper wire connecting them, and a little switch on the side. I said, what is this? That's the learning to be better box. How does it work? I said, well, somebody, one of our residents here at the institution, misbehaves. We trace, track them down. We get a hold of them. They drop their trousers down to just above their pubic area. And then we turn on the box and we shock them. That teaches them to be better. I said, well, have you ever used it on yourselves? No, 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 no. It's for them. Not for us. It's for them. I said, let me have that box. I took off my blazer, I rolled up my sleeve, I turned on the switch, and I put it on my arm. And I was shocked, more ways than one. And that was the beginning of my psychological journey. It was the physical journey of being in the mess that occurred in those days, and then learning from that to go forward. I was a lawyer. So the first thing I wanted to do was to read the law find the case law about this thing called aversive intervention. And as I was doing that work, I also started to do some work in the area of special education, writing the state law in North Carolina, helping to write the regulations for the newly enacted federal special education law. And as I dug into all of this, I realized I needed some frameworks, some taxonomies by which we can live. I want to offer one of those taxonomies to you about education, and then I'm going to leave you with a few thoughts and a challenge. The Individuals with Disabilities Act simply has some very sensible principles and simple ones. First is the outcomes for special education. One is equal opportunity, independent living, full participation, and economic self-sufficiency. And if educators and other people in our business are not working to those outcomes, then they are not doing their jobs. It's very simple. You've heard Ann Turnbull speak about Jay Turnbull and his enviable life. When we were doing that work, it was in order to advance those four outcomes, those four goals. Now, IDEA has six principles that help us move toward those six goals, and they're very simple within the framework. The first is zero reject. Every child with a disability goes to school. The second is non-discriminatory evaluation. Let's find out what the disability is and what the strength is and then tailor program to it. The third is appropriate education. That means individually tailored to make a benefit. The fourth is the least restrictive environment. Do not segregate on the basis of disability. Instead, include and change the structures within which we include people in school. The fifth 
is procedural due process, which is a form of accountability that helps us lawyers and educators alike hold each other accountable. Professionals hold families accountable and students accountable, and the students and the educators hold the professionals accountable. And the last principle is parent participation, which is expressing a democratic way of doing schools because, after all, the schools are funded by a democracy. Now, it's sometimes difficult to put all of these taxonomies together and to put the six principles together and, and to get some sense of, okay, so what? So what do we do? Well, as a lawyer, I can tell you, and I'm sure you know, that there are rights on the books. We can look up the statutes, we can look at the regulations, we can read the case law, and we can say to ourselves, oh, this is the written law. Well, the written law has to exist. It is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Because what is necessary and sufficient is to have rights on the streets. And now we move from what lawyers do writing law, interpreting it, to what you do as a professional, which is to apply the law on the streets for people with disabilities and their families. Now, how do we do that? We do it by conducting research. And AAIDD, which I had the pleasure of serving as a president in the middle of the 1980s, AIDD's membership is a research community. It's also a practice community. And so what we need is research based on the needs of the people who are participating in the research, not the research that we think up, but the research that we do in order to have a direct and immediate or a not so far distant benefit for people with disabilities and their families. So we do research. We apply the research, which means, and this is a tough part of it, that we have to be involved in restructuring how we do business. And a lot of my work back in the middle of the 1980s was restructuring, restructuring IDEA and special education, restructuring the institutional system, restructuring the use of aversive behaviors. One part of restructuring is not just support for people with disabilities, but is support for their families as well. And so as you do your work, you will want to think about two beneficiaries, the person with the disability and the person's family. But there's a third person whom we must concern ourselves with, and that is the person whom you call the professional, the practitioner. Now things really become difficult because if we go back to IDEA and all of those principles, we have to ask ourselves, how does each benefit the student, each benefit the family, and each benefit the professional, the practitioner? It's a tough job. And what makes it tough is that we have to almost disentangle these three beneficiaries and then re-entangle them so that we have a whole approach to solving problems in not just special education, but in disability generally. How do we do that? We do it in part by never losing our capacity for outrage. Let me say that again. Never lose the capacity for outrage. Outrage at what isn't going well and can go better. And another thing is, we never want to lose our allies who help us combat the outrage that we feel. That learning to be better box was outrageous. And had it not been for some people who were in AIDD at the time, I don't know that we would have had much of a difference 
with respect to that kind of intervention or with respect to special education. It's up to each of us and it's up to all of us to act in an ethical and legal way. I want to quote a very, very famous rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, centuries and centuries ago. He said, if not you, who? If not now, when? And my challenge to myself, remembering Jay and Anne and our two daughters and the people who experienced the Learning to Be Better box, was to keep the outrage alive, ask myself, if not me, who? And ask myself, if not now, when? So I put it to you with great encouragement and huge respect that we are in a great civil rights movement still. We started as a civil rights movement in the 1980s, 1970s really, but AIDD did not get really involved in it until the mid-1980s. Started as a civil rights movement. We are still engaged in the civil rights movement. We will always be engaged in the civil rights movement. And I look for you to be part of that movement. It's been a great movement. It has accomplished much. There's still more to do. Good fortune in sailing toward accomplishment of what you need to do. Thank you.